Our featured speaker today is Laura Kruger with Orange County's Mosquito and Vector Control District. Um, I love this sentence from the bio Laura sent us. Laura is a self-proclaimed hardcore bug nerd who believes that the West Coast is truly the pest coast. She is a board certified entomologist with a medical and veterinary specialty and a vector ecologist. Laura began her career as an entomologist slash technical trainer with Western Exterminator Company, and she's worked with the California Department of Public Health in the Vector Borne Disease Section, and she's licensed as a California Pest Control Advisor, Qualified Applicator, and Certified Vector Control Technician. She specializes in, this con in the control of mosquitoes, fleas, and rats, uh, including application rate determination, monitoring for resistance, and calibration of spray equipment. Uh, she's also an instructor at the West Coast Rodent Academy, and I understand there is an upcoming um, session of That's that. Right. So making a plug for it. Yeah, we'd love to hear a little more about it if, if you have that info, Laura. Um, and is an independent pest management consultant. Laura received her Master's of Public Health from Yale University and a BS degree from University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And today we'll hear Laura present on IPM approaches to manage mystery bites. And so we'll hear that module and pause for some questions and discussion, and then we'll hear a module on pest control issues associated with homeless encampments. So I'll pass it right over to you, Laura. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Is it coming through, Shoba? Okay, very good. And yeah. th thank you so much, everyone, for spending uh, part of your day here today. I am excited to present a topic that I, ha I don't think I've actually presented on in the past, but I definitely have amassed some experience, um, and that is about, you know, investigating mystery bites or mystery rash um, in the public. And then I'll just say uh, this first presentation will take probably around a half hour. We'll have a short break to see if we want to have any discussion, and then we'll move into pest issues and homeless encampments, where I will also plug the, the West Coast Rodent Academy. But once again, thank you for having me here today. And I was looking at, at the list of attendees, and I see some familiar faces, or at least see your names there, people that I've worked with in the past. Um, Previously, as Shoba mentioned, I was employed by Western Exterminator Company and also the California Department of Public Health Vector Borne Disease Section. And I have now been at the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District for, <clears throat> excuse me, for 16 years, uh, which has gone by very quickly, I'm happy to say. And the mission of the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District is to educate and protect the people of Orange County from vectors and also to prevent vector-borne diseases in an environmentally responsible manner. And we do cover the entire county of Orange. We are a special district. Our board of trustees is comprised of 35 members, 34 from the cities of Orange County and one from the county at large. And the Board of Trustees has voted uh, so that we provide service for mosquitoes, rats, fire ants, filth flies, fleaborne typhus, limited flea control, but we do respond to fleaborne typhus, as well as maintaining a surveillance program for rodent pathogens and also for tick pathogens. You know, we're all <laughs> probably have watched some real bad TV starring people who live in Orange County, but um, Orange County is of course south of Los Angeles County. We are a large county. Our population is 3.2 million people, and we are the second most densely populated California, California County after San Francisco. Our most dense neighborhoods have about 35,000 people per square mile. And so although Orange County is sometimes described as being suburban, it, it really is mainly dense urban, especially along the northern border with Los Angeles County. And um, in sharing this presentation with a few members of our my lab yesterday, uh, it was decided I should have this content warning. And that is that this presentation contains images and maybe topics that could be considered upsetting, including filth, bugs, skin, rashes, blood, feces, glue boards, bed bugs, homeless encampments, and then my lab mates suggested I add politics, 
bad graphs, and questionable rash photos. So those all were added to the content warning um, yesterday afternoon. So consider yourself warned uh, for the bad graphs especially. But moving on, so you know, what are mystery bites? You know, mystery bites are unexplained skin irritation you know, that is thought to originate from bugs. Now, maybe it didn't, you know, these rashes might not have come from bugs, but it's somehow people believe that they're potentially receiving what they're perceiving as bites um, and from bugs. And I just want to say here that here at Orange County Vector Control, we use the general term of bugs. Bugs is just a term to explain like an insect, a mite, a, um, a spider, a, a beetle, you know, so that's the, the term we choose to use when we're talking to people who have mystery bites. And then a little bit more about mystery rashes and bites is that it, you know, over the years we've definitely seen that there can be an outbreak of mystery rash or bites, and that would be that a group of people um, that share a, sim a similar space, whether that be their home and a family, or maybe it's their office building, and that's probably how most of us get involved, um, or perhaps they're all at a school. Um, that group of people all together report unexplained skin irritations that's thought to originate from bugs. And so whether you know, you're in the local health department, vector control, or even a pest management company, you're gonna uh, encounter these mystery bite types of situations. And the thing uh, that's difficult with mystery bites is that we all react very differently to bug bites. Everyone reacts differently to bug bites. Even people, even an individual person like myself, we may react differently to different bed bug or different types of bites over different time periods. And what is known, and there's been a couple really great review articles that have come out um, over the years, but bite sensitivity in general declines with age. So spending most of my time and days working with mosquitoes and mosquito complaints, we do know that m there's a body of literature to show that report or complaints of biting mosquitoes are not an accurate um, way to monitor a mosquito population because a certain part of the, of the population will never react to mosquito bites. And so bite reactions is not a type of um, disease surveillance or abundance indicator for any pest in general. You know, mosquitoes, sometimes we have landing rates, but in general, you know, there's nothing to do with bites. And as an entomologist and I'm board certified, lots of people want to show us their bites. They want to tell us that, you know, they got these bites from mosquitoes, bed bugs, fleas. This is just something I pulled off the internet, right? But in reality, that's fake news. There, you cannot look at someone's bug bite or a photo of someone's bug, bug bite, or maybe lots of photos of this person's bug bite and actually tell them what is biting them. And that just stems from the fact that immunity to bug bites changes over the years and everyone reacts differently. So there are some stages of bite reactions though in general in the literature. And that is that some, you know, you might be getting bitten by a bug and no reaction. There could be a delayed reaction only. There could be both an immediate reaction and then a delayed reaction. There could be an immediate reaction only, and then stage five would be no reaction. So what we see is people process through these one through five stages over their lifetime of having either no reactions, delayed reactions, intermediate and delayed reactions, or no reaction at all. And, you know, that is specifically referring to biting bugs, but we also have um, allergic reactions to bugs. And so allergic reactions to bugs would be someone who has a direct contact with an, with an insect, I'm gonna say, or a bug of some kind, and that direct contact leads to some sort of reaction, or there could be some sort of accidental exposure. And that's what we normally see when there's an infestation of small things like mites. Um, so there's definitely substances in the environment from bugs that can cause allergic reactions. And what happens for some people and how this turns into like an, uh, um, an ongoing allergic reaction is that the, I, 
they're sensitized to this object, their body's IgE is produced to defend against the allergens, and this leads to the production of allergic asthma. And there's been also, um, this is a really great study, it was reported cases and diagnostics of occupational insect allergy, and it came out in 2023, and this was a group who was looking at people who, who um, have to work with uh, bugs because their job demands it. And what they were able to do is review previous scientific literature and find out that there are 10 insect orders that are known to produce contact allergic dermatitis. Um, I thought what was interesting, you know, we've got here Orthoptera, Coleoptera, so beetles, moths, cockroaches, possibly termites, flies, true bugs, wasps, um, but Sacotidae, that's book lice. And in the report, it was actually a librarian who in her job as a librarian kept encountering a bad infestation of book lice and developed um, this contact dermatitis. But we do know there's other things with bugs that besides just touching them, it's their feces, exoskeletons, scales, wings, even their venom themselves, as well as saliva can all produce allergic reactions. And not all bugs, saliva, feces, exoskeletons, scales, wings, and venom produce allergic reactions in all of these exposure types I'm going to mention, but all of these exposure types were mentioned in the paper, and that would be if you eat a bug, um, if it comes in contact dermally or in contact with your skin, possibly if you inhale um, a bug, which is this is the reason why many of us in pest control have masks on, especially if we're dealing with fleas and flea bites and flea feces, and then the bite of these bugs and the sting of these bugs themselves. So, I just mentioned that because in Orange County, um, and we published this last year in 2023 in the Mosquito and Vector Control Association annual proceedings, is we had an outbreak in a school of people reporting bites, and they were reporting that, um, you know, all the kids were playing outside and that they were coming into contact with them. And we sent our inspector out there, inspector went out there, the school site itself was near a stream. He set and hung mosquito traps. The stream didn't appear to be breeding mosquitoes. He went home later that night and he broke out in the rash. And he was like, what the heck's going on? And we followed up and found that the um, this ongoing issue that the school was believing was, bed, was related to mosquito bites was actually an outbreak of caterpillar associated rash, which is affiliated with the Western tussock moth. And, and this is spines or CD on the moth, the pupa, um, and the adults can irritate people's skin. And so um, we were able to provide the school some, some recommendations to redu hopefully reduce the presence of the stinging um, spines from the caterpillars in the environment. So that's always something to take into consideration is that the complaints of biting is not actually related to an insect, like an an insect that bites people. It could be related to another insect group that has producing something that is causing allergens in the environment. And I thought it was just worth a brief discussion about stings. Are there mystery stings? And just like in general, there are not mystery stings. Most everybody knows when they're stung, um, what stung them. And that could be because they see the bee or the wasp, um, they have to remove the stinger. I know not necessarily that the stinger has to be moved from wasp. Most of the time wasps maintain their stinger. They sting you multiple times, which you can visually observe. Um, but bees, you know, they'll leave their stinger behind. And then fire ants, you're going to start feeling the stings. You're going to look and you're going to see ants everywhere. So really we don't encounter that often mystery stings. But I thought I'd include it to the group. Um, there was also a publication from CDC that came out that, that provided some statistics of like how many people actually die from um, stings and in, and also statistics that come out from OSHA. Um, like, and I just wanted to share this since we're all at work right now, which is that um, from 2003 to 2010, it was estimated that 13 people each year died from injuries due to insects, arachnids, or mites in the United States, um, and that most of the deaths were actually anaphylactic shock due to bee stings. But overall, um, the severity of, you know, 
the deaths related to bee stings is probably possibly not as high as we would think. Although Arizona, there's been a rash of uh, bee fatalities due to kind of the super colony, the large colonies of bees that um, exist in the desert. So kind of ruling out stinging insects, you know, when you we start to you might wonder like how many cases actually are mystery bites. Most of the time at agencies like ours, we maintain a specimen identification program, which allows people from the public to submit insects for identification and we identify them. And we have a an employee, Dave Taylor, who is a board certified entomologist who makes all of the calls and, and administers our specimen identification program. But we tell the public, hey, you can drop them off, you can mail them in, you need to provide some general information, and then we'll get back to you and um, let you know what the findings are. And so this year is obviously not com complete yet, but you know, we receive on average um, from the public probably like around um, the phone calls represents total specimens almost exactly. So about 400 to 480 um, submissions annually. And depending on the year and what's in the news media, um, anywhere from five to 14% of those calls are a mystery bite call where the person on the phone is hoping that we can walk them through this phone call and they'll be able to identify what is causing this bite or this rash on their skin. And I do wanna say that because because Orange County, we have very mild climate here, um, as you're probably aware. Um, we have found a whole bunch of new species in the last six years, including three new uh, mosquito, three new mosquito species, jumping worms, cotton seed bugs that irritate skin, eucalyptus beetles. We reabsorbed the Pacific lamprey after it had been seen in 135 years. We've found some new birds, and so you know we do receive a lot of information through the program and. The problem with these mystery bite calls is, of course, our agency, we've won a DPR IPM award in the past, and our agency is focused on using these IPM principles. Um, and the, the pyramid on the right would be, you know, the classic IPM pyramid, which is that in order to avoid pests, you've got to you know, you got to do some cultural control, you've got to identify them properly. And then based on that, you can use effective chemical use. And, the pyramid on the left represents the urban environment. And so, you know, even in this IPM pyramid, the, the goal is, right, you, that you prevent exposure to things so that you then don't have to spray for them later through screening your house or monitoring. But that all falls apart when some lady's standing at the door and she's got a baby in her arms and she says, hey, my baby's being bitten by bugs. And then, you know, or if there's a pregnant woman and she says, I'm experiencing mosquito bites, especially now that we have Aedes aegypti and those diseases. And the problem, why mystery bites, it's hard to use an IPM approach is that there's really no thresholds. People don't wanna experience bites before they make a call. It's hard to monitor for something that's a surprise or a mystery. Um, and it's also hard with preventative measures. A lot of the times these mystery bites really take people by surprise. They didn't even know to do something to prevent. And then, what we see often is that because there's a bite, people go ahead and they spray, and then they're using these broad scale use products, they're spraying after the infestation's already occurred. So, you know, at our agency, we recommend these steps to deal with these people, which is first, the call to talk with them and to determine the impacted community. And during the call, what we're trying to do is figure out get the person to give this detailed history and share with us, you know, bites, when these bites were occurring and how they were occurring over time. And so for our standard blood feeding pests like bed bugs and lice, um, they reproduce with human blood, they don't have wings. We would expect that over time, the population would keep increasing and that over time there would be more of those bugs. Now we do have some blood feeding pests like rat or bird mites that do not reproduce on human blood. You'll see this question later. Um, rat and bird mites need to reproduce on rat or bird blood. Pigeon flies, bat bugs, even fleas, you know, they can feed on blood, but they're not necessarily going to reproduce on human blood. So a lot of these, we see a pulse of these bugs in the environment. And then over time, they become less and less. And then we have some winged blood feeding pests like mosquitoes, deer flies, 
you know, even some non-winged pests like possibly book lice, right, where these pests are in the environment and they're kind of stable, maybe there's some seasonality, but the people just kind of report having these bites occur maybe, you know, at this time of year or they go away and then they come back. And so conducting the interview with them on the phone is really important to determine, you know, is it just their individual, is it just them? Is this going on in the community? Like trying to recreate what they're telling us. And then also during the phone call, we need to rule out delusionary parasitosis. So delusionary parasitosis is different than mystery bites. And that's because delusional parasitosis is actually a psychiatric condition. It has an ICD-10 diagnosis, diagnostic code. And so the thing with delusional parasitosis is that um, the how you know you're dealing with one of these people is that they have a fixed belief system and they are not going to change their mind. So they believe they are infested with parasites, insects, bugs, maybe a species new to science, and they are going to refuse any sort, they're going to refuse to accept any sort of different explanation for the symptoms. So in terms of prevalence of delusional parasitosis, it's estimated it's eight per 100,000 person years. So we could be dealing with in Orange County alone, like 348 of these people at any given time. It's most common in females over the age of 60, half of uh, people who are diagnosed with delusional parasitosis also have uh, depression. And it's just important to know that this could be considered a psychiatric emergency because risky behaviors could develop if you give these people bad advice, such as setting fire to their belongings or pot potentially even self-harming, like cutting off all their hair and sending it to, uh, you know, which isn't maybe self-harm, but you know, it's a drastic measure. And literature says too, you can kind of identify these people because they're the people who don't just turn in a bug tape to a piece of paper, you know, they're turning in um, a huge bag of samples. And that is why um, you can even delete, you know, the size or amount or quantity of samples can give you a heads up that you might be dealing with delusional parasitosis. And so this is just an example of unboxing one of these samples and then making the ID and what we see under the microscope is just dried white specks or dried skin particles. And so these people are not necessarily mystery bites. And I feel like, and I'm welcome to do this, I need to come back on a later day to talk about delusional parasitosis. So moving back to mystery bites. And I just want to say that in the ICD, um, in the psychiatric diagnostic manuals, the fully I do, the shared psychiatric disorder due to bugs, this is real. And what you know, what this is, is that if you do have a real insect infestation, perhaps others may or may not be impacted, but the fear or anxiety of being impacted by the bugs will cause others to then report bug bites. And what I thought was, and some of you may remember the major flea infestation in Oakland that shut down two schools in 2021 um, due to this issue. I thought it was interesting that, um, in 1899 was the first time that uh, this foie du or the shared psychotic disorder newspapers were running stories about kissing bugs in 1899. And then there's the uh, report that there was this outbreak of people reporting kissing bug bites um, from all over. So just also to realize that if you're dealing with one of these mystery bites called and there's, you know, it's not just in a single home, it's at a school, you're going to get a lot of people reporting the bites, whether or not they're actually bitten. So, of course, after we do our initial um, phone interview, we're asking them to collect the biting pest because we really need, we are never going to identify a biting pest over the phone. We're going to ask the person to send it in or to save it and provide it to their pest control provider. Now, of course, vector controls, pest control offices have microscopes. You're going to need those microscopes if it's a mite or a smaller bug. But most of the time, um, and especially for Northern California, y'all are going to be dealing with the 80s Egypti invasion. I know it's kind of just started. So 80s Egypti is really what brought so many mystery bite calls to our district because so many people were just not aware about the fact that 80s Egypti mosquitoes can breed indoors. And so at least in Southern California, and I know it's similar in Northern California, prior to 80s Egypti introduction, you're dealing mainly with Southern house mosquitoes or house mosquitoes 
Culex mosquitoes, and these mosquitoes spend part of their life in water. They lay their egg raft on water and develop to a pupa and emerge as an adult all within uh, less than seven days in the summertime. And in Southern California, we have this cycle occurring in less than six days, the hottest times of year. And the main issue with the Culex mosquitoes is, of course, they can spread West Nile virus, which is a disease primarily associated with birds. And as a California Department of Public Health reports that as of last week, this is a very low activity year for parts of California. There have been 63 West Nile virus cases reported and six deaths. But once the 80s mosquitoes come to town, the reason why they produce all these mystery bite calls is because they bite during the day, they nibble feed, they have the ability to bite multiple people over the course of a day. They then lay their eggs individually, which can be left viable for years if they are in a shaded space. And so it's really the egg bank left behind on pots and garbage and filth and other things in people's backyard that might be nicer. I don't know, I should say something nice, like, I don't know, kids' toys. Um, you know, it's just yard junk um, and it can leave behind these eggs that um, then the mis when the containers refill with water. The thing with the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, they can spread disease, at least in Southern California. Los Angeles County re reported yesterday the fourth location in the county with local transmission of dengue fever. So you guys, it's coming for you. It's going to happen. It's happening in Southern California now, and it's going to happen in Northern California in the future. And the problem that's challenging with Aedes aegypti and why it results in so many mystery bites calls is because uh, they can breed indoors. They can also breed outdoors um, and they can breed uh, in small volumes of water and they can be transferred from people to people on by the eggs laid in the containers and in the plants. As for dengue fever transmission, as I mentioned, it's coming and we'll just leave it at that for now. The problem why so many mystery bites come after Aedes aegypti enters is these indoor standing water stations. These are all things I've seen with my own eyes. Mosquito breeding in the water reservoir of Keurig especially in office buildings, the water at the bottom of the toothpaste, tooth, um, toilet brushes, shop vacs, um, cans that don't have the plastic in it, waste barrels. We also see a lot with mops. And then we've seen this frequently, which is if you have um, a bathroom or other facility not used regularly, you can get Aedes aegypti breeding in the pee, get in, in the actual plumbing fixture itself. And so the key is, of course, flushing the water uh, at least once every seven days. Same thing with showers, shower drains indoors. And also for those of you resp health inspectors responding to restaurants, floor drains, major problem. Same thing, as I said, shower drains, drains in the landscape around homes. They can, this is what is driving the expansion of Aedes aegypti is the, the yard drain systems and the failure of root irrigation systems. These are the pipes put in to water, um, provide water to trees. And then in commercial districts, there's always a layer of water above the grease trap um, at the warehouse docks. And so this all can produce water. A lot of times people are not aware of the water sources. And so at least in vector control, we can get um, our staff out there and provide additional assistance if we think that perhaps they're, what they're experiencing is bites due to mosquitoes. But in reality, you know, really thinking this through, you know, probably the, the thing that we get a lot, maybe the most calls on is mystery bites in single family homes that eventually lead to people finding bed bugs. And so bed bugs, we wish it was this easy. You walk in your room and they're just sitting on your bed and you're like, okay, we got bed bugs, but it's just not that easy. Um, and that's because bed bugs, um, they, just like other insects, they need to shed their skin to grow. And so in their life cycle, they hatch from the egg and the first instar nymph is very small and it is, it could even be, it's not microscopic, but can be difficult for people to see. And so what you're actually coaching people on the phone to look for in these cases of mystery bites would be um, what I like to call like three signs of bed bugs, which would be the actual bug themselves, their cast 
exoskeleton from having to grow larger and then also the blood spotting which is the bed bug fecal material so the blood spotting um, i tell people on the phone sometimes well have you looked around your bed and it's amazing to me how many people don't change their sheets that frequently like almost never and people who sleep with animals as well on their bed you can get large amounts of detritus can be harder to change the sheets whatnot but a, about a bed bug expels half the blood out of its anus on the way back to its hiding resting place and so you'll get this speckling or fecal speckling it's called and i'll ask people they'll say oh yeah i noticed some black pen spots on my mattress and i'll say well did you put those pen spots there well no well how do you think they got there well, I don't know. Well, it's probably not pen spots. It's probably something else. You know, sometimes it's more obvious when you can get some of this bed bug spotting on the wall in this event. This is like a kid's room and the kid was like squishing them every time they saw a bed bug walking up the wall, leaving behind like some very obvious um, spotting. But a lot of times spotting until the infestation gets large, it might be, you know, on the seams of the mattress or in the box spring in the folds and so it does require um, some deep looking same thing with nightstands same thing with looking at in you know the headboard area and even behind the headboard there can be a large accumulation of the bed bugs and that's because bed bugs are mainly non-active during the day and are going to be feeding at night and the third um, bug that drives a lot of mystery bite complaints, and it can be some frustrating ones, are fleas. And I, um, here in Southern California, it is flea season year round. If you do not, if you live somewhere without a hard frost, you're going to be able to have flea development year round. And the issue with fleas is that we get bitten by the adult life stage, which is very irritating. And our, the adult life stage feeds on pets. But it is really the larvae. So it's, I like to say fleas are like a butterfly where they have an egg, a larva, and a pupa stage. And so <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize, they think, oh, I've gotten rid of the flea the flea issue on my animal or in my backyard, but they're not realizing there's all these eggs, larvae, and pupa, which are continuing to develop. And then those uh, fleas are continuing to hatch out over time. And flea eggs are small. They don't stick to the host. Um, I do want to say this, like for all of us who have pets, about 80% of us have a pet that has fur on it. If you have a pet with fur, the pet should be on flea treatment year round and what happens is if the pet gets fleas the adult flea lays an egg these eggs then fall off the fur of the host into the environment um, and this is a picture of flea dirt looking at an adult looking at your pet if you see flea dirt that will fall off the pet into the environment and it will feed it will be food to the eggs that will then hatch to larvae the larvae then hatch and form like a pu a pre pupa and then they form a cocoon stage. Sometimes they are ha they the flea themselves covers themselves with a silken uh, cocoon, which also has detritus from the environment, and that means that this life stage is almost impenetrable to insecticides. And so that's why when you have flea infestations, it's going to take a minimum of two services in order to get rid of the infestation and some people will say well what if i have just put my pet on flea control won't that get rid of the infestation studies have shown that it will get rid of the infestation but it will take about 60 days so if you're willing to wait that long um, then you can just treat your pets only and not treat the environment but there's always a possibility of adult flea emergence. And so fleas emerge from the pupil case in response to vibrations, heat, or CO2. And so this is a picture of a pest control worker's pant legs walking into an abandoned home, immediately getting covered with fleas. What can be frustrating about fleas and mystery bites is when someone in an office building believes that they're getting bitten by fleas. And you're in the office building, you're doing the inspections, there's no fleas there, but you come to believe that perhaps 
a coworker is has a flea infestation in their own home and then is bringing the adult fleas into the building on their pants or potentially someone who works in the workspace is feeding animals outside of the workspace and as employees are work, walking into the workspace are picking up adult fleas. So basically, when it comes to fleas, you always need to have an animal present for in order to get the cycles of fleas going. And the worst infestations are if you, someone has like a nesting animal in their backyard, like a nesting possum, it gets hit by a car. What happens is all the rest of the developing eggs, larvae and people will start to emerge on the property. And so these people will be very confused because they don't own pets. And based on flea development and life cycle, 60 days, those fleas will continue to emerge from a nest site if an animal does not return back. And this could be an issue, at least in Southern California, and it's coming for you, Northern California, which do because of fleaborne typhus. Typhus is a serious illness. It's transmitted by fleas that can be found on pets and also backyard wildlife like possums, skunks, raccoons, feral cats. And the best way to protect yourself is to limit animal nesting on properties and limit feeding of animals and animal nesting at work sites and then protect yourself when removing dead animals. But urban wildlife can really play host to a large number of fleas. And we know that it's possums have the most fleas. This holds up in Northern and Southern California. You look at a possum, there's probably, on average in Southern California is 100 fleas on it. Same thing with skunks, 60 fleas, there can be more. Feral cats, on average, we see about 10 per feral cat, 10 fleas per squirrel and nine fleas per Norway rats. So you know, when you have a flea infestation, you've really got to be looking at what else is in the environment. Are there other furred animals? Is there some sort of policy at, that's allowing people to feed animals um, at a feeding station, um, and which we know can be attractive for disease? And oftentimes, these sorts of conditions exist at schools where well-intentioned people are feeding animals at the school site. The animals burrow underneath mobile classrooms, and um, it ends up that in some instances, your children might not be safe at school. So I'm now transitioning to, I'm just going to highlight, um, our agency has conducted over the years a number of school investigations. I mentioned the caterpillar rash. This is an investigation which which dealt with rat mites at a local elementary school. And as I breeze through this quickly, I just want everyone to really have some understanding for how frustrating these mystery bites can be. So hey, Laura, sorry, yes. I sorry to interject. I just want to give you it's 1015. Okay. So you know Perfect. five minutes. Thank you. Morning. Yeah. We should be almost there. Thank you, Shoba. Uh, so I will say, you know. Before our agency became involved in this particular school site, teachers had been dealing with um, bites on themselves and on their students. They had contacted a pest control operator who had made multiple applications of pesticides, both inside of the school, because it was an emergency, you guys. It's an emergency if kids are getting bitten at schools. And so that allows people to just act without really taking the time to see what's going on. And, and this is why we should not do that. This is the worst case scenario, which is that everyone's complaining, the PCO is contacted, they make some applications, it just keeps getting worse. The teachers, we our agency begins receiving complaints. Classrooms are then physically bust out of the school site and moved to another location until on May 30th, our agency was contacted, we responded, um, we looked for uh, signs and tried to collect insects and we were able to locate mites coming out of the electrical panel. And so these mites, we could tell they were kind of, it's hard to see them, but they were red, they looked blood fed um, and they were emerging into the rooms where the students were located. And so we were able to take those mites back and identify them as the tropical rat mite. And so I just want to just remind the group that tropical rat mites are not able to survive off of human blood alone. They live in the nest of rodents. But then if you remove a bunch of rodents and you don't treat the nest, those blood feeding pests will come out looking for another host. This same cycle happens with 
birds um, that migrate or fledge the nest. And actually tropical rat mites and northern fowl mites can be found on birds and rats and they share the mites and that's most likely due to their infest uh due to the area where they are um at hold on one second i thought i silenced it okay so there was a lot of coverage of the the villa park and the media um experience that happened at this school site and it really illustrated how bad communication at a school site can lead to lots of problems for students and staff. This is just an, a map of this Villa Park Elementary School and rats were found in 65% of the classrooms and rat mites were found in a number of classrooms. And you might wonder like, how can it get that bad that, no, that all of these teachers were seeing rodent activity and you know, nothing was done about it. And I think it speaks to the larger issue of mystery bites, which is we all know from pest control, every job is a custom job. And oftentimes the worst pest problems are related to the worst communication problems internally as well. And so by figuring out the target pest in, at Villa Park Elementary School, and then by actually collecting it and going around and conducting control, we were able to stop the bites on both the kids and students. Um, and thankfully this infestation occurred in May, school was out for the summer and the school was able to be cleared for students to return in the fall. And so I just will share, um, we've tried at Orange County Vector, we tried to publish a number of papers about this phenomenon, you know, your children might not be safe at school, an outbreak of biting rat mites. We also have another one, we, vector control, we might have a problem. This was at um, biting mites that were associated with wood chips at a local elementary school. And so uh, if you'd like more information about those, you can refer to those publications. So we do recommend it, you know, take that detailed history from people who are reporting these bites or rashes, determine the impacted community, identify the target pest and, and initiate a pest sighting log so that someone at the facility or even in the home can kind of record when people are bitten, De try to determine if the blood feeding arthropods are present, and then determine if birds, rats, or urban wildlife were recently removed from the area. And then for delusional parasitosis, those are really best referred to their physician for follow-up. And then depending on where you work or what sort of recommendations you, you know, you can recommend habitat modification or pesticide application. And then of course, after there should be some sort of evaluation to determine success of the intervention. Okay, so this one I, I mentioned to show about earlier is gonna be uh, slightly shorter. And I just want to also say to the group that, um, Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District, we do have 700 miles of flood control channels in Orange County. And um, we have our inspectors, our technicians, our boots on the ground. They are out in those channels every single day. And so I wanna say thank you to our staff who provided photos, Inspector Danny Bowie, Inspector John Savage, um, Dave Taylor, and Supervisor Carlos Martinez. And I just also wanna tell the group that our inspectors take this very seriously. And so I hope that, um, I'm gonna use the term homeless. Um, I know that Los Angeles County Public Health prefers us to say people experiencing homelessness. And I just want the group to know that we don't mean any disrespect to the population in the encampments. Um, if I choose to use the wrong uh, language to describe the work that is being done at our, our agency. But this first photo you're seeing here is kind of a, this is the Santa Ana River waterway. And in 2018 in Orange County, we had a large population of homeless living on the Santa Ana Riverbed outside of Angel Stadium. And so the encampment was estimated to be, you know, multiple miles in length. And this is a picture from the Orange County Register of um, the bike path, which is supposed to allow people to ride their bike all the way from the mountains in San Bernardino all the way down to the ocean. And so there was a lot of impact in this area in 2018. And I also want to direct the group to this amazing 
uh, resource, which I found incredibly helpful in preparing this talk, which is provided by Cal Recycle, and it's their homeless encampment reference guide. I guess it is the California state standard. It has introduction to homeless encampment issues, solid waste management, property standards, involved agencies, and additional resources. So if you haven't checked out this guide, it's very interesting, and it, it provides the correct language to discuss encampments, you know, whether they are official or permanent. I'm going to refer to them as homeless encampments, but I do respect that there are many different types of encampments that, especially in Northern California and especially in the county of Alameda, that people are dealing with. And um, in interviewing our staff who are in and out of the flood control channels, I will tell you that, you know, in, on July 25th, when Gavin Newsom ordered state agencies to move homeless people outside of camps through his executive order N-124, and in that order, um, it says, whenever feasible, site assessment in advance of removal operations to determine whether an encampment poses this immediate threat to life, health, safety, or infrastructure, um, such that exigent circumstances require immediate removal of the encampment. And so this was the first time, you know, any direction to our knowledge here at Orange County Mosquito and Vector, you know, we had been making this argument for years that um, some of these encampments in these flood control channels were really impeding water flow, and we were not able to work successfully um, to have that mitigated. But our boots on the ground have said that actually slightly before this official um, executive order that we have seen conditions change here in Orange County for the better. And that has to do, of course, with when you're talking, thinking about homeless encampments and pest issues, one of the things that you want to consider is like, how long has the encampment been there? And the longer the encampment has been there, the more food, shelter, harborage is available for pests, primarily rodents. And now our agency, we do have a best management practice booklet, which is our storm, you know, mosquito control and stormwater BMPs. And so in this booklet, this is the, the like the minimum requirements that our agency asks from the other agencies involved in stormwater conveyance um, so that we can keep the water moving and so that our people can get in there and make mosquito control treatments. And a lot of what we have is based on um, what CDPH has produced. And I think I saw Dr. Marco Metzger on this call earlier. And so he also produced this um, minimizing vector production and stormwater management and treatment structures document. So there's all of this document saying what the flood control channels should be looking like in order for water to be moving or for access for the local mosquito and vector control to make treatments. And I just want to remind everyone that, you know, water is probably one of the most regulated substances in the world and definitely here in California. And so our agency does hold all permits necessary to deal with flood control agencies. But ultimately, you know, it is private access permits. We one, something that can be challenging is getting access to some of these areas where encampments are and getting permissions from local landowners in order for us to um, conduct these assessments and then work through our our internal procedures and then our procedures with other external agencies in order to get issues addressed. So how our agency has chosen over the last four years to move forward with addressing um, some of the homeless encampment issues in the the sources that produce mosquitoes is by using our vector reduction program and I will put in the chat a uh, link to this but the vector reduction program was created in conjunction with our district's um, CEQA requirement and so it identifies guidelines um, establishes guidelines for identifying significant vector sources. So just looking at a homeless encampment you know a tent in a flood control channel that you know, may be inconvenient for our inspectors, but what we're looking for to take it to this next level of declaring it a significant vector source um, is something that actually would lead to the production of actual vectors like mosquitoes, rats, fire ants, or flies. And these vector, the vector reduction program is authorized under the health and safety code, and it is our pathway to abatement. So what that means is most of the time we can collaborate in a 
positive fashion with the landowner, whether it be the County of Orange or not, or others, and then move through this collaborative process to address these issues. But as I said, mosquito control is complicated, as is homeless encampments and issues around homeless encampments. And in Orange County, we have mosquitoes and homeless encampments in our marshes, in our underground storm drains, um, along our curbs, um, and then within our city infrastructure. So just in terms of what is vector control responding to, the public will call vector control out um, in res because of filth and because of how long the filth has been present and because of standing water that could be, uh, you know, if the filth is obstructing flow. And when our inspectors respond to these complaints, the homeowners who oftentimes abut directly to the encampments, you know, they're complaining about, you know, theft, safety, and noise, none of which are, um, related to the vector control mission, right? But in this example, we're looking at a homeless encampment and there is no impact to this flow channel. This is under the 22 freeway. So although there is a lot of, you know, accumulation of harborage, potentially food for rodents, at least from a mosquito control perspective, the homeless encampment is keeping everything out of that channel. This would be an example, you know, another thing we get a lot of complaints about um, drugs, needles in this photo um, you know you can kind of see some of the homeless people lined up against the flood control channel wall um, potentially doing drugs and blocking access of our spray trucks and this is a sometimes we go across the border and we were called to look at an encampment that uh, in los angeles county for where, which was experienced an outbreak of flea-borne typhus and just walking through the encampment um, in the alleys, we could see needles everywhere. And I just want to reference once again, the group to the Cal Recycle Homeless Encampment Reference Guide, which actually talks about how many hundreds of thousands of needles have been removed from, home, from the 11,800 encampments um, that Caltrans responded to in the last five years. It's pretty interesting. But most of the time, you know, our, our techs are complaining about obstruction of flood control channel itself or access to the channel. Um, homeowners, of course, are complaining about other things, but um, this would be one of the main issues is not being able to get our spray truck or not having our people being able to walk along the channels. And then, of course, just dealing with the tents themselves. Um, I've heard multiple stories of our inspectors announcing themselves and they're trying to like walk over the tent um, and there's people inside who aren't responding. And then, of course, obstruction of water flow, as we see here with just a large accumulation of material in the actual flood control channel. And you can kind of see some of the sparkling bits of standing water that are left there. And this would be more of a you know, a true obstruction of water flow, in which case, if our inspectors were able to um, sample mosquito larvae, you know, some of our inspectors, if they have shovels on their truck, they will try to clear the channel if it's too much debris, um, or they believe that there could be needles present or other safety concerns, that's when we would work with the um, county to have the channel cleared in other ways. And just more examples of, you know, we get a lot of complaints about smells, about the presence of trash, and also about the presence of food. Oftentimes food is just dropped or left at the encampments. Lots of illegal dumping as well. You know, why vector control gets involved outside of debris inside the channel, stagnating water, um, you know, would have to be sometimes related to pet issues with homeless encampments. Um, We've also responded to rats in homeless, associated with homeless encampments. And I'll also note that um, there's been some studies that came out that estimate pet ownership in the unsheltered homeless population of Los Angeles to be about 12%. So like one in 10 uh, people experience homelessness are gonna have a pet, which is very unlikely to be on a leash, you know, most often running around um, the encampment we have had I believe it's four people bitten by stray dogs related to homeless encampments. But interestingly, um, the majority of our bites of the stray dogs have been in relation to homeless encampments, not on a riverway, but actually um, in 
restrooms at local parks. Sometimes like a homeless person in their entourage will go in the restroom and take over a stall. And then a lot of times our people go in the restroom, maybe they're not realizing there's a homeless person in there and then the dog is biting them then. So they feel like, you know, our staff didn't know there was a dog in there. The dog didn't like someone else. They didn't know going in the restroom. So we actually have initiated a policy um, here at Factor Control where we told our staff two years ago, we do not recommend them using any public restrooms um, any longer due to the bites. And then, you know, you have homeless people who encamp on the streets and then you can kind of have uh, people camping in their vehicles and bringing all sorts of animals with them. In this picture you see here, you know, a couple dogs, but then there's also a crate, um, maybe there's a cat in there. And so with, when people are moving their animals around in their vehicles, then they're also, you know, moving food to city streets to feed the animals and so on. And that food then can also feed other um, urban wildlife and rats. And then there's these, um, do good organizations. There's one in particular called drive by do gooders. And this is interesting. They do these things called pet food drops. And so in this photo, right, you've got someone who's receiving pet food, experiencing homelessness and the pet foods like in a plastic bag. But on other websites, you can see people might not have time to put it in the plastic bag and they're literally just like shoveling, um, food, animal food out in the vicinity of the homeless encampment, which then feeds lots of different animals. Of course, feral cat feeding, it's an issue at schools, it's an issue at homeless encampments, and that's likely because of the great trifecta, I call it, the three properties that have the most homeless encampments, at least in Orange County, are going to be county flood control, um, railroads, and Caltrans, and those are all places where there are a lot of feral cat feeding as well. And as we mentioned earlier, that impacts our local urban wildlife. So it's interesting that these homeless encampments can have so much urban wildlife activity around them. And then I chose this. This is a Reddit picture that everyone sent me. I think it was two years ago, which is, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, you know, feeding urban wildlife and just feeding urban wildlife puts the wildlife in contact with people experiencing homelessness and you see things like you know people picking up the possums driving around with them sitting on the side of the road with their raccoon um, their trained raccoon friend and uh, lots of homeless people and their squirrel friends and so what that's all doing is it's putting the food and the urban wildlife close to people and i just wanted to end today with one story which was happened in 2019 in Orange County and it's in the news and you can Google it, which was the story, the story of the mysterious pet rat infestation at an Orange County homeless encampment. And so this was in 2019 and this has to do with the city of San Clemente. And at that time there was a large homeless population along the beach. The city of San Clemente wanted to move the homeless population and they tried to establish a temporary shelter, which was like a fenced area. Um, away from the beach where homeless people could bring their items and recreate. I do not believe there were tough sheds or structures there, but it was just, it was built as this safe space where homeless people could congregate during the day. And what ended up happening was um, citizens began posting videos online and um, I'm not going to share them here, but you can check it out. And the video is like near this official established home, homeless encampment. There were these rats, but the rats were not roof rats. They were domesticated, fancy rats, um, many with the colorage or the plumage that you see here. It kind of looked like someone had purchased rats and then brought them to the homeless encampment to say that the homeless encampment had a rodent problem. And that, in fact, is exactly what happened. Um, our inspectors went out. They were able to literally pick up with gloved hands, the pet rodents that were wandering in this area and like put them <laughs> in a container and bring them to the local animal care shelter to adopt out. But I think it just goes to show how it is necessary to investigate um, pest control issues near homeless encampments. There's a lot of rumors, people spread fake information. And so by being able to go to the site and determine if the pest press is present, then um, that can obviously, you know, help direct resources to where they're needed. 
And I will say this is my pitch for the West Coast Rodent Academy. Um, this takes place twice a year. It's taking place next week, October 9th through the 11th at UCNR South Coast Research Station. It is sponsored by the um, Pest Control Association of California and also the South Coast Research Plaza. And so I'd invite anyone to check that out. And we specifically go through guidance for dealing with rodents, whether it be at homeless in encampments or if it's in someone's car or vehicle, according to published guidelines. And, you know, we definitely know that homeless encampments come with rats. It has, it's because of the filth and the sanitation issues, of course. It's been well documented in the city of Los Angeles in response to an ongoing typhus outbreak. And so rats and other vermin infest LAPD downtown station, sparking anger among officers. And if you, the picture caption says, um, as at least one, but as many as three LAP detectives at the downtown station have contracted the strain of bacteria that causes, it says typhoid fever. They were trying to say typhus, though its origin is unknown. And then, you know, Skid Row in general um, is an area of Los Angeles County, which has been um, home to homeless people since the 1930s. And it has also developed an ongoing flea-borne typhus issue. And it is those piles of trash that leads to rats being able to feed on it. And this is data from Los Angeles County Public Health, which shows um, that there are outbreaks in the wholesale district and downtown LA and Willowbrook, which were related specifically to homeless encampments. And I'll remind the group of um, the San Diego A hepatitis outbreak in 2017. And this was a outbreak primarily amongst the unhoused. There were 592 cases of hepatitis A, which resulted in 20 deaths and a declaration of a local health emergency. And, um, and that's why you see here a city worker or a contract city worker out there disinfecting the streets um, and just dis literally disinfecting the streets, trying to get rid of the high prevalence of hepatitis A. So I'd like to thank um, the Alameda County Vector Control Services District. They've done a lot of work in um, Oakland's homeless encampments and they've published some papers about the work they do. And um, one of those papers is by Mooney et al. in the Vertebrate Pest Conference Journal, which is an overview of the district's operations around the Oakland's um, homeless encampments. And then also an additional publication by Dan Wilson uh, at Alameda County Vector Control Services, which looks at um, characteristics of homeless encampments and how to reduce disease, vector-borne disease potential in those homeless encampments. So I'd like to thank everyone for your attention today. And at this time, I, I'm willing to attempt to take any questions about uh, pest issues in homeless encampments.